I don't have much time. On the cold floor of this prison cell, I find myself desperate, scribbling this letter. Not to simply recount the events that have led up to this, but as a warning to you all. The stories you have read, all the reports on the news, barely even scratched the surface of what we encountered that night. I turned myself in, not because of guilt or because I was trying to escape, but because it felt like the only option in order to escape whatever this thing was. I would much rather be writing this letter to Diego and Lucia to send them assurance of my safety and see if they even made it. However, the mysterious power outages, the noises at night, the shadows that are seen walking among us, it's become clear that this thing has actually followed us here. I beg you, or anyone that finds this letter, to share it, especially online, on TikTok, YouTube, or any other place where people might actually believe in these things. Share it in places where people are asking questions. And I beg you, please, take this serious. Because this isn't just a story. It's a dire warning. The cold metal floor of the Suburban pressed against me. I could feel the shaking and the noises of it in my bones. I was sitting in the back between a father, Diego, and his young daughter, Lucia. The sounds of the engine combined with the scraping noises of the tires against the gravel filled the silence. In between all the noises, the dim light of the vehicle's interior showed Diego's face. He leaned in closer to me, making sure his daughter couldn't hear. Are you, Are you sure, sure about no. this? Diego asked with a tone of anxiety and hope. His eyes, though, showed concerned. I nodded, trying to show him confidence in my ability to get them across. However, inside of me thoughts of doubt existed. Memories of the past, both successful and disastrous, flashed through my mind, reminded me of the weight, the responsibility, and the risk. Their desperate eyes looked to me for hope. They had paid 10000 each for this, a price that I knew too well. Most people think that as a coyote, all that money is for me, when actually, the money gets divided among many hands. First, there was Maria in Mexico. Her job was essential, to find people like Diego and Lucia, desperate enough to pay and believe. And of course, people were everywhere. So she was the first one to get her cut of the pie, you can say. Then, the driver Carlos. He was the one taking the biggest risk. The one who would face jail time if he was caught. Well, we would all face jail time if caught. But he would be considered the primary smuggler, with us acting as victims. He knew all the landscapes and the roads very well. We met a few years back but we didn't go into business until around a year ago. He had the nerves and the courage. He knew all the roads to take, the shortcuts, what to avoid, and what to do when we came across a detour. And of course, Carlos came with a price tag. Every plan, every decision, every move was well crafted. Crossing the border wasn't just about getting up and going. It was a game of chess. One where everyone had its role, and our best piece was our inside man, Miguel. Miguel was different than the others, a border patrol agent who still remember his roots, you can say, where he came from, and the struggles of his family a generation or two before him. The system was his day job, but by night, he would quote-unquote help those who are trying to find better opportunities. I say it this way because as you all know, people in life just don't help you freely. There is always something in exchange. And so Miguel would take his cut as well. And sometimes there were others too. Agents who we would turn a blind eye, getting their own payment as well. You see, decades ago, things were simple. Border patrol wasn't as advanced as they are now. Drones which now patrol the skies could see just about everything. 
And with technology advancing so quickly, there also came more hoops to jump through, more hands reaching out, more people wanting their own piece of the pie as well. The checkpoint lights of the border seemed to welcome us as we approached, the huge lights slowing anyone to a stop and helping break the darkness of the night. The gate ahead stood as the final barrier to cross into Texas. As always, Miguel knew our deal and what day of the week we would come by. He was manning the controls as well. He recognized our approach, signaling us to pull up ahead with a friendly wave. He peeked inside the Suburban and he said, So there's two today, he remarked with a smile. No post, you're consistent my friend. And sure it gets to the right place. He then signaled to his colleagues and the massive gate bar slowly opened. As we drove ahead slowly, Miguel yelled at us to stop. Carlos then slowed the Suburban to a stop again. I rolled down the window and said, Hey, que pasa? What happened? Miguel then said, Get out of the car and come to the front, both of you. For a split second as Miguel yelled at us, some thoughts were flashing through my mind. Was this the moment Miguel turned? Over the years, the risk of somebody betraying you was always there, especially with the pressure that everyone and the border patrol agents were under. One could never be sure. Carlos and I looked at each other nervously. Had Miguel finally decided to play it straight and turn us in? The nervousness grew as we exited the vehicle. The dry landscape around us was illuminated by the moon and stars, making everything around us appear even more isolated. The only sources of light were from the border patrol checkpoint. The floodlights and the distant sounds of generators and the occasional radio were the only sounds that interrupted this environment. Walking towards the front of the vehicle where Miguel was, I noticed his face was showing no emotion. And then, he finally broke into a chuckle. Gotta keep you on your toes, amigo, he said. Always making me sweat a little before letting me through, huh? I said. Miguel was one of those jokesters who liked to pull pranks and as he said, keep us on our toes. I'm not sure if he did it on purpose or to throw his colleagues off. For example, one time, he made everyone I was transporting to get out of the truck and quote unquote search us. Then Miguel's demeanor then shifted to a more serious tone. Hey, listen before I forget, there's something I think you should know. There's been some strange things happening lately. I stayed silent and nodded my head, urging him to continue. It's the disappearances, he said in a low voice. Whole entire groups have been vanishing. We had a family we let through earlier this week, and just last night, we found them. I held my breath. What do you mean found them? Miguel hesitated for a moment. They were dead, but it wasn't like any scene I ever come across. The bodies, they were mangled, twisted in ways that don't seem natural. Their eyes were missing. They looked like some kind of animal attack but it's nothing I had ever seen. The strange thing is, no bullet holes, no knife cuts. It's as if their bodies were broken and twisted everywhere. Even some limbs were ripped apart and others twisted in ways I had never seen. I felt a shiver run down my spine. Do you think it's something to do with the cartels? He shrugged. Could be, but even the cartels have a specific way to their madness this it's different like i'm not sure maybe someone or something not human it's weird just keep your eyes open and stay safe out there i nodded all right you're good to go ahead miguel said but don't forget it climbing back into the suburban i got into the passenger seat while diego and lucia stayed in the back I could sense their fear radiating from their looks of concern. As far as Miguel's mention of it, I knew he was talking about the payment for the two passengers. Yet my mind kept circling back to his warning. Most stories and crimes from the border are always linked to the cartels, 
But the way Miguel had described the situation, it was disturbing. I used to work with other coyotes, but as time went by, I realized just how dirty this business could be when it's in the wrong hands. Their methods were evil, just thinking about the money, not the well-being of the people we were transporting, cramming people into the backs of the trucks, trailers like livestock, often without water. If they were pulled over, it was every man for himself. The ones who had taken the responsibility for those lives would bolt, leaving scared families to fend for themselves. You hear reports all the time. I think it was a few years ago when Houston police found a huge rig with about a hundred immigrants trapped inside. Of course, we knew who it was and who did it, but it just shows you that once you get paid in advance, they don't care about you. There is one incident that stands out. Halfway through a journey, a young boy fell ill, most likely from the extreme heat and lack of water. He slowed the group down. The other coyotes, with whom I was working with back then, decided he was a liability. They actually wanted to leave him and his mom behind in the middle of nowhere. The argument became heated and I stepped in, managing to persuade the group to let them stay. However, that incident was the turning point for me. It was no longer just about the money. It's more of sleeping without the guilt of things that you could have done in the past. They would abandon families halfway into the road. A father, a mother, a daughter, or son. It didn't even matter. If someone held us back, they would just be left alone. And well, this approach troubled me. They had already received their payment, and to them, anyone slowing the process was just added baggage. I had seen fathers get separated from their families. Mothers left crying for their children. These were humans, and for them to turn a blind eye was just wrong. I decided to break away from this group of coyotes. It wasn't an easy decision, and it came with risk. Going without them meant that I had to build a new network, find people, and operate discreetly to avoid drawing attention from my former partners. But my guiding became clear, ensure the safety and well-being of every person under my care. Over time, I developed a reputation for fairness. Families trusted me to get them across because they had heard stories of my dedication. I may have charged less than the others, but I slept better at night, knowing that I wasn't sacrificing human lives. Furthermore, I would move people in much smaller groups of only couples or small families. The road was still dangerous, but now I had a plan. I was determined to make every journey as safe as possible. If a situation got risky at some point, we would stay in place for days until it was clear. I would always give the family the most a week to cross. If we didn't make it, I would rather return the payment than to put ourselves and them at risk. However, Miguel wasn't the last piece. The most significant cut went to Bill, a Native American who owned a vast, secluded farmland on the Texas border in Big Bend. His land was the safe passage, the bridge between dreams and reality. He demanded a steep price for turning a blind eye, for sheltering the hopeful souls on their journey. From the 20,000 I collected, only a fraction truly belonged to me. It was a risky venture. But to me, it was worth it. After successfully crossing the border from Mojinaga, the road ahead seemed both promising. The landscape transformed quickly, leaving behind the desert open landscapes and trading it for the beauty of the Big Bend region. This huge wilderness area seemed like the perfect cover. Our plan was to avoid the border towns and the watchful eyes of Border Patrol by cutting through the heart of Big Bend National Park. This road will lead us straight to Plata, Texas, where Bill was waiting. As we drove through, the landscape began to shift, a dense, small woodland between the mountains. This now meant that we were in the heart of Big Bend National Park, 
The natural beauty surrounding us was a testament to the park's untouched wilderness. However, with this beauty came an eerie silence, broken only by the sounds of our vehicle and the occasional rustling of leaves or distant animal calls. As Carlos drove ahead through the forest area, the dim glow of the dashboard was lighting up the interior. Carlos, always running in his mouth, had been rarely quiet for a while. I took a deep breath and broke the silence. You remember what Miguel mentioned about those bodies they found in areas like this? I said, trying to bring in a little humor. Carlos took a deep breath. Yeah, even I heard rumors back in Ohinaga, but I brushed them off. I thought they were just that, rumors. However, I seen rumors that some of the local ranchers have stumbled upon bodies not too far from here. Not just any bodies, but ones that, well, they weren't right. I frowned. What do you mean? Torn apart. Some of the older folks in town were saying something about old legends. Things that roamed the woods, especially near the border, Carlos said. You're talking about a chupacabra, aren't you? Carlos hesitated, then nodded, among other things and rumors. But whatever it was, it has people scared. Even the bravest of coyotes are steering clear of certain roads from what I heard. I never encounter anything around here though. Man, why did you have to bring up those stories now? This place is already scary enough. I smart, just trying to lighten up the mood. He chuckled nervously. Well, it's not working, Karnat. As we were driving, every so often, the sounds of birds, I guess, echoed all around us. All the noises of the nightly critters could be heard with the steady hum of the suburban's engine until suddenly the engine sound turned into a sputter, groaned, and then after one last cough, fell silent. We knew that even though we were far from the border, we weren't safe. The hundred mile border law meant that patrols could stop and search any vehicle within that radius, hoping to catch people just like us. As the vehicle came to a stop, I looked back at Diego and Lucia. I could see Diego's grip on his daughter strong. Again, I could see fear in their faces. Carlos then said, let's see what's wrong. Grab the lights out the glove compartment. I grabbed them and gave one to Carlos, and then the two of us stepped out into the darkness. The night was dark, with only the lights of the stars and the moon above. There were no street lights here. No signs of people. We were alone. I held a flashlight while Carlos popped the hood, revealing a bunch of hoses, wires, and metal. As he started moving stuff around and trying to figure out the issue, I would try to crank the ignition, hoping for some sign of life. But the Suburban refused to turn on. Feeling the weight of the situation, I approached the back to reassure Diego and Lucia. We'll figure it out, I whisper my voice being a little shaky despite the situation. Lucia was holding a small doll, her source of comfort throughout this journey. As I walked back to the front of the vehicle where Carlos was, my feet started crunching on the dry gravel. I stopped as memories flooded back. I thought about all those who venture into these same fields, driven by the promise of a better life. I stared into the surrounding darkness. It felt pretty cool even though the temperature was still pretty high. As I was thinking, that's when I heard it. A faint whisper. It was coming from the tree line just a few yards from where we had stopped. Help, it said. The voice of a young boy, fragile and on the verge of breaking. My heart raced as I tried to place the direction of the voice, but I froze. Every instinct urging me to dismiss it as a figment of my imagination. But it sounded so real, with my flashlight pointing down, casting a small circle of light on the ground. I slowly raced it, allowing the beam to cut through the darkness and bring light to the edge of the woods. But there was nothing there. 
just trees, their leaves rustling gently in the night breeze. The sound, the voice had faded, but I felt shivers down my spine. I took a deep breath, trying to rationalize the experience. Maybe being exhausted and the stress of the journey were getting to me. Maybe it was just the wind playing tricks, but I couldn't shake off the feeling that I had actually heard something. Actually heard someone, that is. Nervously, I made my way back to the front of the Suburban, where Carlos was still trying to figure out the engine's issue. As I approached him, I could hear him saying words under his breath, cursing at the vehicle. Carlos, I began, my voice low and cautious. Did you, um, hear that just now? He paused, looking up from the engine with a confused look. Um, hear what? A voice, I replied, swallowing the saliva in my throat. From the woods, it was somebody saying, help me. Carlos stared at me for a moment. The thought of hearing a voice was both scary and unexplainable. You know, I'm this chingando cabron. Stop fucking around, dude. He said. We both stood still in silence, with only the calls of the night critters and the trees making sounds. The weight of our situation, combined with this experience, made the night feel even more scary. While waiting for the engine to respond, Carlos and I leaned on the vehicle's frame, both of us trying to plan out our next step. Well, Bill's farm isn't too far from here. Carlos said, wiping the sweat from his face, even though it wasn't that hot. If the Suburban doesn't start, we could possibly make it in foot in a couple of hours. I nodded, processing the idea, as it was our only option. With a heavy sigh, I made my way to the back of the Suburban, deciding to discuss the possible plan with Diego and Lucia. As I was walking back, I kept looking at the tree line, to see if that voice would call out again. I'm not sure what I was looking for, but even if I did see something, I didn't know what I was gonna do. It didn't help that everything was pitch black, as I could only distinguish a few things because of the moon. But overall, everything was dark. I found Diego and his daughter together, their eyes showing a mix of hope and nervousness. Hey, um, listen, I began. If we can't get the vehicle going, we might have to walk the rest of the way to Bill's farm. It's not too far. However, we would have to cross through this small patch of woods right here. Diego sat still for a while, and then he nodded, bringing Lucia close to him. I could see the weight of responsibility that he carried for his daughter, trying to protect her and provide comfort. I continue, it's going to be a long walk, but I promise you, it's safe. After talking with Diego about the plan and trying to make sure that they were okay with it, I turned my attention back to the hood of the car and to Carlos. But as I approached the front, the engine was quiet, the hood was still up, but Carlos, who was just there moments ago, was now gone. A rush of panic went through my whole body. The area was silent, except for the distant chirping of crickets. This is the reason drivers get paid, I thought to myself, trying to use my sense of humor to overcome the fear. Every story, every warning about the dangers of these roads rushed back to me. Carlos, I called out. The weight of silence bore down on me, making my voice actually sound low. I took a few steps in front of the Suburban, shining my flashlight around. There was no trace of him. I circled the vehicle praying that maybe he had just gone off to relieve himself or that he was trying to find a better view to see which way we could go but there was nothing no sign of him my mind started to race to all things did he go to find help? maybe he heard something or saw a patrol and decided to hide the possibility seemed endless and none of them were reassuring that's when I felt a chill run down my spine as I thought back to that voice from the tree line. However, pushing aside the fear that I had, I knew I had to do something. I started to shine my flashlight everywhere, sweeping the area, looking for any sign of him. Carlos! I called out again, louder this time, hoping that he would answer. 
Suddenly, from deep within the trees, I heard a faint chuckle, followed by a voice that I instantly recognized. Hey, over here. We need to cut through here. It's the fastest way to Bill's farm. As the voice of Carlos came from the tree line, a confused feeling and concern gripped me. Why did he venture off without us? What could have possibly made him go disappear into the dark woods? Without a word, that is. I squinted my eyes, trying to make out more than just a faint shadow of Carlos against the trees. But the trees and the night sky covered him. The weight of bearing bad news was never easy, but I had no choice but to tell Diego that we would have to walk. As I turned, I was met with an unexpected sight, causing me to leap back in shock. Diego was standing there, inches from me, with Lucia clutching his hand. My heart raced, and a rush of adrenaline left me. Jeez, Diego, don't sneak up on me like that, man, I said. With my voice slightly shaky from the sudden surprise, Diego raised an eyebrow, a mix of concern on his face. Hey, uh, sorry, he replied with a grin. They didn't mean to scare you. It's alright, just give me a bit of warning next time, alright? I nodded towards the direction of the trees where the voice of Carlos had come from. Hey, Diego, Carlos has gone up ahead, trying to sound as confident as possible. Diego, with a confused look, but why without telling us a thing why would he do that i'm not sure man i replied but i heard his voice from the trees right there i know he's waiting so we should hurry up and regroup with him bill's farm isn't far and we can make it if we move quickly let's go get the backpacks from the sub and then we'll start walking towards the woods as we went back to the suburban everything just seemed off as we started walking a few feet to where I had seen Carlos by the tree line, that's when I heard it. Another voice. Hey, adonde van? Where y'all going? It was unmistakably the voice of Carlos again. But this time, it was filled with confusion. I turned sharply in the direction of the second voice, my flashlight revealing the familiar face of Carlos, looking just as confused as I was. As I looked back towards the tree line where the first voice had come from, there was nothing. No sound. No movement. Just the stillness of the night. Diego stepped in front of me with his voice shaky. What's going on? Carlos, now clearly behind us standing by the hood of the Suburban, looked at the tree line with a suspicious look. Hey, I just went to the trees to take a leak. I heard someone call out, and I thought you guys were leaving without me. The confusion hung heavy in the night air. My heart started to race, trying to process what just happened. Hey, get back in the vehicle, I said in my voice mixed with fear and urgency. I heard the voice of Carlos, coming from that way that we were just gonna go. Carlos interrupted, his voice with concern. Hey, I wasn't anywhere near until now. We need to get out of here before somebody finds us. Nodding in agreement, I said. All right, let's all stick together. Nobody leaves the vehicle. And Carlos, if you think you can fix it, let's get out of here as quickly as possible. I think I know what's wrong with it. I was thinking about it when I was out there taking a lead, said Carlos. As I rushed Diego and his daughter to get back inside, Carlos got underneath the hood and told me to try to start cranking. I then got inside and saw Diego and Lucia in the very back, looking nervous. I cranked the vehicle and the engine came to life, breaking the long silence that was around us. A wave of relief flooded through me as I realized that we wouldn't have to walk through the woods. Carlos emerged from under the hood, his hands smeared with grease, but with a smile on his face. You're gonna find this crazy, but it was a loose wire. It should hold up now though he said, wiping his hands on a rag. We stepped to the front of the vehicle, and I asked Carlos if this should hold up at least until we get to Bill's farm. He said it should, but we'll have to look into it as soon as we can. As we closed the hood of the sub, that's when we saw it. There was a dark figure, standing along the shadows of the tree line. A chill ran down my spine. As the silhouette began to get revealed more, and just like that, a voice echoed, 
calling now. Help me. Carlos and I stared at each other. Without saying a word, driven by fear, we sprinted back inside the Suburban. As we got inside, my heart started to pound against my rib cage. Carlos floored the gas, but I couldn't help myself. I turned my head to see through the passenger mirror. The figure was distorted, and it was starting to move. Actually, no, it was twisting as it attempted to walk with its form growing smaller in the distance as we drove away. That fucking voice, Carlos, I whispered, trying to make sure that Diego and Lucia didn't listen. It's that same fucking voice I was telling you about. Carlos glanced over at me and with a concerned look in his eyes. I heard it as well when I was taking a piss. Who knows what the fuck is going on here? Breaking the tension, I turned to face Diego and Lucia. Bill's farm is just ahead. I reassured them, trying my best to make sure they didn't question our looks of fear in our faces. The good thing is that the windows in the back of the Suburban were dark, so I know it was impossible for them to see out back. How much longer till we get to Bill's farm, Carlos? About 20 more minutes if this damn sub doesn't break down again, he responded. Memories of Bill surfaced, recalling our first meeting at a cultural festival in Texas. An event filled with tradition, dance, and music that celebrated native heritage. A moment where cultures intersected, bridging gaps and understanding each other. I met Bill during one of these cultural festivals in the heart of Texas. The festival aimed to showcase a fusion of traditions from native dances and Mexican mariachi music to all types of stuff crafted by natives and Mexicans. Bill actually had a stall there, demonstrating traditional Native American weaving techniques. The fabrics told stories with patterns and colors, speaking stories of their ancestors and the land they called home. Next to him was a group of people performing a traditional Mexican folk dance. The two cultures, so different, yet with so much in common, was fascinating to learn about both. I approached where Bill was at, drawn by a design that, to my surprise, had patterns that I had seen back in Mexico. We began to talk, and I learned that some patterns were universal, representing themes like life, death, and nature, which actually resonates across cultures. Bill, with his welcoming demeanor, expressed interest in my Mexican roots. As our conversation deepened, I learned about the expanse of land that belonged to his family for generations. I shared stories of my hometown in Mexico, the traditions, the festivals, and all the challenges that we faced. Another common theme was that Bill was interested in creatures of lore and legends, some of which had roots in Native American stories passed down through generations. He spoke about a wendigo, a creature born from greed and transformed into an evil spirit. I, in turn, would tell stories from my hometown, La Llorona, the weeping woman who wandered the rivers searching for her children, La Lechuza, the witch, El Nagual, the shapeshifter, and even El Chupacabra, the fear blood sucking creature, which I will actually tell you about if I have time later on. However, what caught my attention the most were the dream catchers that were designed to ward off evil spirits and apparently offer protection. Bill started speaking passionately about these items, explaining how some were made using traditional methods passed down through generations in his Native American community. You see, these are not just decorative items, he said, holding up a dream catcher. They're instruments to protect you. This dream catcher, for example, is said to protect your sleep from nightmares and negative energy. I found myself fascinated, not just by the items he sold, but by the stories and traditions they represented. So through our discussions, Bill often talked about more intricate and custom pieces he had back at his home. You should come by sometime. I have pieces at home that I believe you'll find more fascinating, he said. Taking him up on the offer, a few weeks later, I found myself visiting Bill's farm. The property was a testament to his heritage, 
and his deep-rooted connection to the land. It was here that our conversations grew, leading to confidence and deeper insights about our own journeys. When I first set foot on Bill's farm, I was immediately surprised by how big it was. The land was stretching out as far as the eye could see. Bill actually gave me a tour of the property, pointing out the different sections and eventually taking me to a secluded work area. This space, covered by all the trees, was where he crafted his items and kept his collection. After this, he invited me to the main house. The walls were lined with his handcrafted artifacts. Bill offered me a beverage. We settled into a comfortable conversation. You know, he began, sipping from his cup. From the discussions we've been having, I sense you have a rich history and culture behind you. Have you ever thought of crafting and possibly selling artifacts? I paused for a second, taking his words in, and with a deep breath, I said, Actually, Bill, I'm already involved in a different kind of business. What I would like to discuss is the possibility of using this land of yours as part of that business. Bill took a moment, processing what I had just offered. He studied me for a long moment, the weight of my request evident in the air between us. Finally, he broke the silence. This land is sacred to me and my ancestors. It's a piece of our history, a testament to our survival and culture. If I let you use it, I need you to keep your word that you'll respect the traditions and use it only for good intentions. Bill leaned back on his chair. For every person you bring through this land, he began, I will need a certain percentage. This land isn't just a piece of property. It's a part of my tradition of my ancestors. Using it this way comes with its own cost and risk. We shook hands, sealing our agreement. As I made my way to the door, ready to leave, something caught my attention. There was a streak of what seemed to be black dirt or black dust lining the door frame. Curious, I pointed towards it. Hey Bill, what's this for? Bill hesitated for a split second. Then, he said, that's black ash. Then, in a low voice, that's, that's to ward, ward off. off. Yinadroshi. His simple answer sent a shiver down my spine. I didn't ask him who Yinadroshi is, but I figured it was some kind of spirit, similar to the other ones that he had told me about when I was asking him about the dream catchers. And that's how me and Bill became partners. I had been using his farm for a while, and as a bonus, he treated us like royalty when we were there at the farm. He got along with everybody. After about 30 minutes and seeing familiar landmarks appearing, I realized we were approaching Bill's farm. As Carlos drove the Suburban down the driveway, leading to the main house, the land was very calm. Instead of animals grazing, the goats and sheep were laying dormant, apparently in a deep sleep. The closer we got to the main house, the more a creepy feeling came over us. The whole house was completely dark, no light filtering from any window. All the normal farm sounds were missing. Carlos brought the Suburban to a stop and said, something, something doesn't, doesn't feel right. right, he whispered. I tried to remain optimistic and said, maybe Bill just went to sleep early. That's when Carlos pointed to the front door. It was slightly open, swaying gently with the breeze. Or maybe something's wrong, he said. Suddenly, the stillness was shattered by a distant scream. I reached and grabbed the flashlights. We need to check this out, I said. Carlos then nodded. As we both got off, I approached the back door and told Diego, Hey man, we're going to go inside and see where Bill is at. Stay here and we'll be right back. He simply nodded still holding Lucia in his arms. As we approached the front door, I noticed signs of a struggle. A broken lamp was laying on the ground, the glass reflecting the moonlight 
tools and a basket of veggies laid on the ground as well. As we entered the house, the beam of the flashlight revealed the living room in a mess. Chairs were overturned and a framed picture of Bill with his family was laying broken on the floor. Carlos called out, Bill, Bill are you here? here? His voice echoed through the silent house. Suddenly, from upstairs, we heard a small whimper, followed by a hushed voice murmuring. Drawn towards the sound, we made our way up the creaking staircase. The voice was growing louder, and as we reached the top of the stairs, we saw Bill. He was seated in a circle of what looked to be salt, surrounded by lit candles, holding onto a worn out book. His face pale, looking up, revealing a mixture of relief and fear. It looked like he was praying. He then looked at us and said, The, the movement, movement of people, people across the land, especially, especially during the night, has disturbed, disturbed the resting places of such things. His face then turned towards the window, opposite of us, where I saw a shadow quickly move out of sight, and then, he looked back at us and whispered, Yinadroshi is here. I recently found this channel and I was hoping someone out there might have advice on what I can do. I have nowhere else to turn. For some backstory, I first saw this thing around 15 years ago. I was around 12 at the time. I lived out in the countryside on a small stretch of land surrounded by a dense forest. I lived with my father, who was an outdoors man, and naturally, we often hunted game in the woods and farmed the land, basically living separated from any people, with the nearest town being well over a two hour drive. I remember it being a cold night. I had just come in from putting our animals inside for the night two horses and some chickens for those who are curious and I was getting ready to settle in for the night maybe watch some TV before bed it wasn't long until I heard Misty our mare making some noise outside she sounded awfully distressed so I went to the window to see if any coyotes were prowling about as they were very common in the area what I saw was no coyote but I wish to god it was a coyote it was a tall figure, if I had a guess, about seven to eight feet tall, standing in the yard right below my window. It had a weird shape and decaying body, with arms that were elongated and almost the size of its entire form. I slowly scanned up its body until I looked into its eyes. Two empty black pits on a bald, pale and deformed head with a mouth lined with jagged teeth were staring right back at me and I felt my blood run cold like it was staring into my very soul. We stood there for what seemed like hours staring at one another waiting for one of us to make a move until it spoke. Come to me. It was my father's voice but everything seemed wrong about it. It was monotone and distorted like ripping the tape out of a plain cassette. I bolted back to my bed and hid under the covers until the sun came up. I didn't sleep at all out of fear for what was outside my window. This continued for night after night for about four weeks. The creature would show up at random times after sundown and never leave until the morning. I was being stalked by this thing like it was playing a twisted game with me by calling to me with its raspy voice or dragging its claws down the window panes and walls from outside until one day it all stopped i was unsure at first and still stayed awake for the following nights awaiting for the creature to return but it never came back and that brings us to last week i moved to another state following my father's passing years back he was killed under very mysterious circumstances and I couldn't help but think the creature was somehow involved. Anyways, I was making some tea at around 10pm to try and have some downtime after a stressful day 
I have these glass patio doors that look out into a small creek, not too far from my backyard. I saw something move from the corner of my eye, and so I looked towards the door, and there, it was standing. The same thing I saw 15 years ago was back. I'm pretty sure it killed my father and now it wants me. I screamed and dashed to my closet and grabbed my bat, but by the time I returned to the patio doors, it was gone, leaving no trace behind. This was over a week ago. I've done some research, and I think this thing is a crawler, or flesh gate. Almost like in that movie where all the women go to a cave. This thing isn't too far off from one of those. I don't know what to do. I'm begging to anyone that reads this. Is there any way that I can get rid of this thing? Or am I just waiting like a pig to end up dead? I never told this story to anyone, and I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today, and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also, along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just want to say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced in area was only a small part of the property but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I really get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced-in area and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark, no city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room, and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night, or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree but the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it the dog also creeped me out but you know angry dog and i was a kid it happens now i do get scared pretty fast i always been that way for example i have trouble walking through a lit house if i'm alone my friends however tend to be more outgoing. 
just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over. His name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down, and by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in, like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. We hadn't heard it before, because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest, for miles, and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing, and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway, right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing, and he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room, but I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there, without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear, but he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out, but it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him, but when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes, so I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer, and that's when he followed me, like right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom, who was fast asleep. Then, I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty, and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um, in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believe me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it, 
and Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything. So after a while, I calm back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time. And I'm inclined to believe him. Because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settled down, but I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence, so the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts, I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said, the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly, the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's going to wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone, but there's absolutely no way I'm going to go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open, and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, Whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall. In my mother's low voice. The same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away.
but that one night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night unless I'm with a bunch of people and I will never, ever live in the woods again. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed hearing about this as I probably won't tell the story again. Thanks for listening. When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place, only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs, and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head, and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder, or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag labeled with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. Padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. In order for his claim to be true, an intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29th stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that or they picked up a 1600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two-bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked them to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands tried to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night, but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag, and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished, it was already 8 p.m. I made my way out to the fields, and one at a time, I guided each cow to its assigned stall. I got through about ten or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, about fifty meters away from everything else and all the others, was a cow, alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange, though, 
was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I was not eager to tell my boss they had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last, as I continued to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. I shuffled to the field, and surely enough, she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came up on her, I could hear a definite, but muffled, chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear, searching for a place to reinsert her tag, but there was no piercing. I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it, but still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on with the clock ever ticking. I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me. Not so shy now, I wonder. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again, but this time it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself, wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak, a slow vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the eight foot tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. Its pupil seemed to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body, its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. 
That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. Oh, oh, oh. The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figured it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now. I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, Hey kid, stay away from the night shift. But he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. He just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. For a few months, I've been having a feral cat that comes to my back porch looking for food. I first saw him in October around 6 p.m. when the sun was going down and I had walked to the back door to take a smoke outside. I could see him through the double window that looks out onto the swamp beyond. He was sitting patiently as if he had been waiting for me. His black greasy fur reflecting the colors of the sun. When he saw me approaching, he stepped closer to the window and stood on his two back legs and started to paw wildly at the window. I chuckled and walked back to my fridge, pulling out some leftover chicken breast from the night before. I grabbed an old plastic dish from the cabinet and I tore the chicken apart into bite-sized pieces. I returned to the back door. I opened it only enough for me to squeeze out so that he wouldn't bolt into the house. If he did, I knew I would regret it, letting him slip inside only to possibly infest my home with blood-sucking fleas and to tear up my furniture. I placed the dish down and he pranced towards it scarfing it down like it was his first meal in weeks. I looked at him closer through his long fur and could see how thin he was. His legs looked like skin and bone and his cheeks looked sunk in, causing his eyes to protrude out grossly. It was then that I noticed his tar colored eyes that had no glint to them, no shine from the setting sun. It reminded me of those computer screens that don't reflect pesky sunlight glare coming from your window. I felt uneasy, worried now that he may attack me. However, he looked at me once and blinked slowly 
before racing down the porch stairs and disappearing into the wooded swamp. I started to wake up every morning only to see the dead corpse of some poor animal when I would take my routinely first smoke of the day. It started with little animals, birds, mice, and other small rodents. I always figured it was just the way that cat was thanking me for feeding him when he came, which was only a couple of times a week. Even though I only saw him a few times, there was always a dead animal on the porch step every morning. I thought it was silly that some old cat would bring me presents every morning. After about a month, the corpses began to get bigger. I was finding more bigger rats and the occasional possum. I started to think it was strange that this cat seemed to catch his dinner just fine, but still came to me for scraps. I always brushed it off though, seeing as it wasn't doing me any harm and I had no roommates who may have been disturbed by it. However, on one particular cold and foggy morning, I walked to the back deck to have my cigarette and I looked down to look for my present. There was nothing there. I could feel my heart flutter. I was worried that something may have happened to my little buddy. That feeling quickly left and I felt my stomach drop as I looked over the railing to see my lawn filled with bodies. I placed a hand over my mouth to catch my gasp. The sight was disgusting and a less than pleasant encounter when all I wanted was to enjoy a smoke. After that occurrence, the dead animal started to appear once again on the back deck. Part of me felt relieved that my cat was okay, while the other part of me felt like something was terribly off. Sometime in January, I woke up in the middle of the night, groggy as hell, but with a strong craving to have a smoke. I walked down the hall and paused at the window overlooking the backyard and I saw a pale figure that reflected the moonlight. I paused and my eyes widened. Suddenly I was no longer groggy and the urge to smoke disappeared. The figure looked up at me and I froze. My breathing stopped. I could see its sunken in eyes staring at me and its spine protruding from its pale skin that had patches of fur peppered. It looked very strange, almost human-like, hunched over while standing on two legs. I panicked and I could feel my body growing hot as my heart beat quickened. After staring at me a little longer, it turned around to crawl over the fence and then it walked away on its two legs. I went back to bed completely terrified. I woke up the next morning and rubbed my eyes, releasing a big yawn. I thought to myself, what a crazy dream I had. I got up from bed and walked downstairs to make myself a pot of French press coffee. I grabbed my pack of smokes and my mug and walked out the back door. I walked to the rail with my mug and crossed my arms and leaned over. I instantly dropped my mug and could hear it shatter on the concrete below. Time felt like it had slowed as I looked around to see corpses lacerated and splayed across my yard. The black feral cat was strategically 
in the middle of all the dead bodies. No mercy was spared to any of those animals. I felt my stomach heave and I threw up what was left of my dinner from last night. I felt a chill run down my spine as I remembered what I had seen the night before and I no longer believed it was a dream. I quickly walked back to the door and locked it shut behind me. It felt surreal and I couldn't imagine that this was happening to me but to my dismay it was. I couldn't be bothered to clean all the bodies. I was too fearful to walk out that door. I stayed inside the house for the rest of the day on my computer looking for solutions to my problem. Of course I found nothing but nonsense about some beings called rakes, wendigos, and skinwalkers. I strongly felt that this was some person playing a massive prank on me and I desperately wanted to believe that was the case. I fell asleep at the table in front of the back door. Being the light sleeper that I am, I woke up to a gentle but loud knock at the door, followed by a few more. I immediately sprang up and swiveled around. I pulled the blinds away from the door just enough to peer out the window. Nothing. I walked to the window beside the door and shrieked at what I saw before me. The creature I had just seen the night before had pressed its hands and face against the window and was breathing heavily with a wicked smile plastered against its face. I ran to the counter and snatched my keys, running out the front door to dash to my car. As I got in, I began backing out. That's when I saw the creature come around the side of the house, only to stop when it saw me backing away. It then stood up on its two legs and gave me a slow wave, showing off its nasty pointed teeth and its disgusting smile. I retreated to my sister's home, which was about 30 minutes away, and I busted through the front door with no explanation. She came running down the stairs with her boyfriend following close behind her. She flicked the lights on and could see how disturbed I looked. Taking me to the guest room downstairs, she told me I was welcome to stay as long as I needed. After refusing to tell her what went wrong, I felt crazy after what I saw part of me still believing it wasn't real and another part afraid she would think I was crazy. A few days passed and I was beginning to feel more at ease. My sister was making breakfast by the time I woke up and I nodded to her and her boyfriend as I sat down at the table when there was a ring at the doorbell. I went to go see who was there as I saw my sister was busy and her boyfriend was enjoying a little small talk with her. I opened the door and was surprised to see no one was there. A putrid smell struck my nostrils. I looked down to see the half rotten body of my feral cat. I pulled into the bar parking lot and stopped the car. I sat there for a moment, letting the engine idle as I thought about what I was doing. I knew my wife and kids were at home, waiting for me, but I just couldn't bear to face them right now. 
The thought of spending another evening with them, avoiding the elephant in the room, made me physically sick. I closed my eyes and cursed myself. Everything was going to shit. My wife was pregnant with our fourth child, and I simply wasn't making enough money to support us. Over the past six months, our quality of life had slowly declined, and it was becoming harder and harder to explain to the kids what was happening. My wife and I loved each other, but the financial difficulty sprouted endless arguments that could last late into the night. The truth was, I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen to us. I didn't know how to pull my family out of this terrifying nosedive. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about that day when we would be kicked out of our house. I started having trouble sleeping and my mood worsened. I would find myself snapping at the kids over little things. So instead of taking out my fear and frustrations on my family, I started to drink after work. At first, it was just a beer or two, something to take the edge off. But after a month, I began to stay late, drinking more and more. It was time that I needed to think. It was a few moments of peace. My wife hated my habit, and I didn't blame her. She never argued with me about it. But when I came home reeking of beer and whiskey, she would have this look, that look that said everything. I never really was a drinking man before I fell on hard times. Even in college, I never drank much. Never to the point of being seriously drunk. I just didn't see the point. But now, that my life was crumbling before my eyes. I found comfort in drinking. It was a space I could enter and push my thoughts to the edge of my tire, mind. And tonight, I needed a drink. Before leaving work, my boss told me that they were conducting layoffs in the coming weeks. He didn't go into detail, but as I sat in my car, I realized that he was unofficially informing me that I would soon be jobless. I felt sick. What the hell am I going to do? How was I going to provide for my family? Growing up, I never expected this. Why would I? The thought of my kids made me terribly depressed. They depended on me. They looked up to me. How was I supposed to tell them daddy couldn't pay the bills? I pulled my car door open and forced my mind to settle. I licked my lip. I almost ran into the bar. Music droned somewhere above me as my eyes roamed around the room. Neon beer signs lined the walls and their colors trailed in the air as I sipped my six rum and coke. My head was floating above my shoulders and the conversation around me slurred and streaked like wet paint. I licked my lips and they felt bloated on my face. I blinked lazy and realized I was taking a heavy breath. I shifted on my bar stool and almost fell off. My mind exploded with dizziness and my stomach churned. How many beers had I had before starting the endless rum and cokes? I couldn't remember. The bar was surprising full but I couldn't focus on any individual faces. They piled around me, trying to get in drinks, and I felt like a rock sticking out in the middle of a moving stream. I raised my glass to my mouth and drained the last of its contents. Hey Jack, you should go home buddy, the bartender said, leaning towards me out of the pool of mixing colors. Maybe one more, and then I'll head out. I mumbled, raising my head to meet his gaze. His face swam before me, and I closed one eye to stop it from moving. I think you're done, buddy. Come on, go home to your family. I could feel darkness swirling around the edge of my vision. I snorted and the bartender shook his head. Hey, Jack, you want me to call you a cab? For some reason, I found this incredibly offensive, and I shook my head violently. 
Uh, piss off. I'll be fine. My head felt like a bloated boulder. I dug into my pocket and pulled out some crumbled cash. I threw it on the bar and stumbled towards the door. I felt like I was walking through a movie scene that I wasn't supposed to be in. People were turning to stare at me and I was too drunk to register shame and I shoved some punk kid aside and pushed myself out the front door. The world rocked beneath my feet and I felt a sudden urge to vomit. I exhaled slowly and dragged my feet towards my car. I was in no state to drive. I gripped my teeth and checked my watch. It was after 10. Shit. I banged into my car, still looking at my watch, and let out an angry grunt. I ran my hands over the door until I found the handle and pulled it open. I didn't dare look at my phone and see how many missed calls I had. I sighed as I climbed into the driver's seat. I needed to rest for a moment, settle my head. Then I would drive home and apologize to my wife. I would wait to tell her about the layoffs that are coming. But first, I needed to sleep. I closed my eyes and darkness rushed me. Hey there, Slick. I pulled my eyes open. Blinding sunlight immediately forced them shut again and I rubbed my face, trying to clear my mind. To my surprise, I felt all right. In fact, I felt fantastic. I opened my eyes again and sunbeams warmed my face. I was sitting in a sprawling green meadow. Birds chirped overhead and green grass rustled beneath me. A pleasant breeze chuckling through the air. I was sitting against a tree in a circular clearing with swaying forest that wrapped around a sparkling pond. It was breathtaking. For the first time in months, I felt peace settle in around me. The blue sky overhead was cloudless and I closed my eyes as I raised my face to absorb the gentle sunlight. Beautiful, ain't it? I snapped out of my trance and shot a look over to my left where the sudden voice had come from. There was a man sitting against a tree, not five feet from where I sat. He was in his mid-forties and was wearing a tan suit, a silver watch on his wrist and his sports jacket wrinkled against the bark. His green eyes sparkled underneath the brim of a blue baseball cap. Where am I? I finally asked. The last thing I remember was passing out in my car, drunk off my ass. The man smiled to reveal perfect teeth. Uh, don't worry about that. Ain't no use in it. Just relax and enjoy all this. His accent added to the pleasing atmosphere and I found myself comfortable around this stranger. My, my wife, I need to get back to her and my kids. I said without much conviction, it was just so impossibly gorgeous here. I knew that I needed to get home, but the overwhelming calm I felt made it hard to put action behind my words. They're not going nowhere, Slip, the man said, closing his eyes and taking a deep breath through his nose. Just take a load off and enjoy yourself. I leaned back against my tree and ran my hands through the blades of grass. The woods filled my head with a beautiful scent. A combination of dirt and fresh rain on wood. The pond before me glittered like a mirror, filled with diamonds, and I found myself smiling. Whatever this place was, I never wanted to leave. All my worries seemed so trivial here. The overbearing stress I had felt earlier was gone. By the way, I'm Russ, the man said suddenly from his spot. I turned and saw his eyes were still closed, but he had a small smile. I'm Jack, I answer, watching a silver fish jump from the surface of the pond to snatch a bug. The man chuckled. Oh, I know who you are, Slick. I cocked my head at him. Who, who are you? What, what is this place? 
Russ adjusted the ball cap on his head before answering. I just told you, I'm Russ. And this, he spread his hands. This is just a little slice of peace, buddy. Ain't nothing more. Can I stay here? I asked. Russ snorted, but there was no malice in it. I'm afraid not, partner. That wouldn't be good. This place isn't meant for that. Not anymore. I raised an eyebrow. Not anymore. Before he could answer, a noise echoed in the forest around us. It was distant and low. A single deep note that crawled up the sky and fell upon us. It sounded like the beat of a great drum. Russ pulled his cap and sat a little straight. What was that? I asked him. As the sound faded, Russ looked at me, his eyes uneasy. That's why you can't stay here for very long. The drum sounded again, and again, and again. A constant beat that filled the woods with a single ominous note. And for some reason, it filled me with a creeping dread. Not good, Russ mumbled under his breath. What is it? I stressed, feeling uneasy. Russ stood up, brushing himself off. It's the whistling man. He's bad news, Slick. You don't want to be around if he shows up. I wasn't following anything he said, and it must have shown on my face because he raised his hands. Listen, you need to leave, he said as the drum slowly began to grow louder. Why? What's going to happen? Russ waved me off. Nothing good, Slick. I'll tell you that much. You can come back, but not when he's around. But where is here? I sputtered as Russ advanced on me. Before he could answer, the forest filled with a piercing cry, a sharp whistle that cut through the sky and echoed all around us. I slammed my hands over my ears as the deafening note danced across the sun rays and exploded across the meadow. As the wavering echo faded, another whistle followed. This time, lower, sort of haunting that chilled me instantly. The drum was growing louder, and I thought I felt the earth shiver slightly beneath my feet. Russ turned to me, his eyes wide. Get out of here. Go. He shoved me backwards and I stumbled, tripping over my feet, and woke up gasping in my car. I immediately opened the door and vomited into the parking lot. A great gush of hot stomach bile and gurgling rum. Tears leaked from my bloodshot eyes as I sat up and wiped my mouth. My head was splitting and I was desperately thirsty. I looked at my watch and groaned. It was a little after midnight. I took a few seconds to collect myself, thinking back on what I had just experienced. What just happened? I could still hear the echoing shrill note of that whistle. Or did I? I ran my hands over my face, the consequences of my nighttime drinking churning my stomach again. How was I going to explain this to my family? What would I tell my wife? I know she was going to be furious. I suddenly wish I was back in the meadow. The serene peace it had offered upon arrival was intoxicating. No worries, no stress. No responsibilities, just warm sun and beautiful, accepting nature. As I started my car, I made a mental choice. I would do anything to go back. And now, I thought I knew how to get there. The next two days were a waking hell. As expected, my wife was pissed. She wasn't a woman who yelled or threw things. I almost wish she was. Instead, she turned to ice, barely acknowledging my existence. I try to be extra active with the kids, even taking them out for ice cream. But still, that wasn't enough to get my wife too warm to me. It was the weekend, and every minute seemed like a chore. On the outside, I was super dad, making sure to always wear a smile and engage my kids in conversation and playful fun. None of this made me and my wife closer. 
and I felt the thirst return to me with a vengeance. I still hadn't told her about the layoffs, and judging by her mood, I wasn't going to tell her until her fury had passed. When Sunday night rolled around and she still wasn't talking to me, that's when I decided that after work the following day, I would return to the bar and get shit-faced again. I needed to see if I could go back to that meadow. I needed it, in the worst kind of way. My own sanctuary, of peace. I knew it was the worst thing I could do, but the frustrations of the weekend pushed logic out of my frazzled mind. She didn't fully understand the stress and worry that I was going through. She didn't know the weight I carried every day. It wasn't her fault, but I expected her to cut me some slack. As I slid into bed that night, I licked my mouth and focused on tomorrow. The need was so great, I almost got up and left right there and then. What little reason I still possess forced my eyes closed instead, and I tried to summon the vision of the meadow. I could almost feel it, waiting for me right behind my eyes. If I focused hard enough, I thought I could smell the greenery swirling through the swaying forest. If I shut everything out, I thought I could hear the frogs croaking at the edge of the water. Was that Russ? I was sure. I had just heard him speaking to me, but it was all just out of reach. For whatever reason, I couldn't quite access that special place. I needed a catalyst. And that's how I found myself slumped over the bar the following night. The day seemed like forever. The clock indifferent to my desperation. On the way to work that morning, I had stopped at the liquor store, but had managed to hold off. My boss didn't say anything to me, which I took as a good sign. My wife still wasn't talking to me, barely looking my way as she got the kids ready for school. I had tried to give her a hug goodbye, but she brushed me off, saying something that she had to finish packing lunches. This sparked an anger in me, and I left the house, clamping my teeth shut so I wouldn't say anything stupid. I knew getting wasted tonight wasn't going to repair any teetering marriage, but I had been pushed to my limit. If she wasn't going to forgive me, then what was the point? Her morning coldness had cemented my resolve to go out tonight, and I barely felt any guilt. I justified it in my mind. As I pulled into the bar parking lot, I felt a cool blanket of relief sweep over me. This was where I could let go a little. This was where I didn't have to think about my issues. I tipped the glass to my mouth and sucked the rum off the ice cubes. I hadn't bothered mixing my drinks tonight. I had a destination in mind, and I wanted to get back there as soon as possible. Judging by the way the room swam, I was doing a pretty good job of it too. The bar was empty, and I was relieved for it. A quiet tune played from the retro jukebox in the corner, and I hummed along as I tapped the bar for another refill. The usual bartender was off tonight, Kenny, and I was grateful for it. He had a tendency to cut me off and I didn't want that tonight. I smiled at the young lady, and I said thanks as she placed a fresh rum in front of me. I was trying my best to maintain my composure. I didn't want to stop drinking until I couldn't see. I drowned half the rum in one swig, and felt it slam into my stomach like a derailed train. I burped behind my hand, and felt my eyelids swell. I smacked the taste from my mouth and my tongue burned with alcohol. My thoughts had become hard to control. The alcohol filling my mind like a sinking ship. I had been here for three hours and I felt like if I tried to stand, there was no guarantee my legs would obey. I tipped the glass to my lips one last time and that was enough to cloud my vision with a heavy fog. Blackness pressed in on my slosh brain and I ran a hand over my face. It felt like there was a face over my face. I giggled at the thought, but was suddenly overcome with sadness. I blinked a few times and decided it was time. 
I cashed out with a mumbled thanks to the bartender and very carefully walked out to my car. The world rocked beneath my feet and the full moon was so bright I had to shut one eye against it. My head felt thick and every breath tasted like ice and spiced rum. I stumbled to my car and managed to get the door open before collapsing into the driver's seat. I rolled my head back and shut my eyes. A small smile on me. I waited for it to happen. Hey there, Slick. I opened my eyes and gentle sunlight lit my vision. Stunning greens and blues melted together to form breathtaking beauty and my senses filled with a peaceful meadow before me. I was back. The dense forest encircling this pocket of paradise swayed gently in the breeze, the leaves rustling together to form a serene soundtrack to the majesty of this hidden nature. The grass was soft beneath me, like cool blades of emerald silk. I ran my hands through it and leaned comfortably against the tree I sat under. The pond before me was captivating in its stillness, a plate of shining silver. I turned and saw Russ sitting a few trees over. His tan suit jacket was bald behind his head, and he leaned comfortably against it. I had to come back, I said. This place? I trailed off, trying to find the words. It's, it's something, something special, special, ain't it? Russ grinned, crossing his feet in front of him. Yeah, you got that right. Silence passed between us, and I sighed. My head empty of worries and was filled with complete tranquility. The secluded isolation adding to calming magic of the meadow and pleasant birdsong danced between the trees. Again, I was filled with the desire to never leave this place. Everything was just so perfect. It made life seem unfair in comparison. Why were things so hard? Why did misfortune and approaching despair plague my every day? Why couldn't I just stay here? away from all of that and close my eyes in peace. This was all I needed. You know, Russ said from his spot, as much as I enjoy your company, I worry about you. I looked over at him. Why, why is that? Russ adjusted his baseball cap. You know why. Don't make me say it, Slick. Can you just let me enjoy the quiet? I said, shutting my eyes. Russ grinned, of course, but I need you to know something. Before he could continue, a distant drum began to beat. I opened my eyes. Russ pointed out into the woods, towards the noise. That, what about it? I asked softly. Russ stared at me under the brim of his cap. That didn't used to be here. I nodded towards the distant drum. That? The drum? His green eyes bore into my skull. Not, Not just, just the drum. Him. I stared. Russ's voice dropped to a whisper. The, the whistling, whistling man. You can tell when he's around. When the drum starts. He's looking for you slip. And he's never gonna stop. I shifted uncomfortably. Who is he? What does he want? Russ stared out into the forest. Do you really have to ask? I suddenly threw my hands up in frustration. What are you talking about? Before he could respond, the air filled with a shrieking note. A long high whistle that bore into my head like a screaming drill. Swarms of birds erupted from the trees and took flight, escaping the sound. Russ jumped to his feet, with fear all over his face. You better scram, Slick. It sounds like he's close. I don't want to, I shouted, climbing to my feet. I don't care about him. I don't care what he wants. Anything is better than going back to, to out there. Jabbing my finger towards the sky, Russ approached me as the drum beat grew louder. Another whistle slicing through the meadow like a razor blade. It was the same low note as last time, but despite that, the thought of leaving made me want to weep. I had only just arrived. I couldn't leave yet. I couldn't face what awaited me on the other side. 
He doesn't have to be here, Russ said urgently. You have to get rid of him. It wasn't always like this. The drum was deafening at this point, and I felt the soil beneath my feet begin to tremble. Russ opened his mouth to speak, but then a new voice erupted from inside the forest. A horrible, deep voice of rage. Jackie. Where are you, Jackie? Another series of long whistles followed, cracking the air like a bullwhip. The eyes of Russ went wide, and the blood drained from his face. He took a step and raised his hands to me. Go! Go! He shoved me, hard, and I went sprawling backwards, and woke. Nausea tossed my stomach, and I slammed the door open and emptied my gut onto the asphalt. I screamed, wiping my face and pounding on the steering wheel. No, no, I can't be here. Let me go back. Face once again with my looming, life-ruining problems filled me with absolute panic. The night air filled with indifferent moonlight, and I raced my eyes to the sky. I can't do this anymore. Russ, let me come back. I thought I could feel his presence, a tickle in the back of my head. I focused on it begging to be swept away to the calming meadow. I didn't care about this whistling man. I didn't care about what he wanted. I couldn't face my family right now. I didn't want to think about work or money. I just wanted to go back. Please, help me. Slamming my fist into the dashboard. Take me back, please. I sat there for a moment, trembling, bloodshot eyes catching focus on everything. Then, nothing. I wiped my face. You can't do this to me. You can't make me stay here. I checked my watch and saw that it is midnight. Last call wasn't for another hour and a half. I licked my lips and ran a hand through my hair. I felt like crap. I knew I probably looked like crap too, but that wasn't gonna stop me. I'm coming back, I said, stepping out of my car, avoiding the puddle of vomit, and I'm not gonna let you send me away this time. My legs wobbled as I carefully made my way back inside the bar. I steadied my breathing and summoned as much willpower as I could. It wasn't easy. My throat burned and my eyes were watering. The world rocked and swayed beneath me and I gripped my teeth against it. I pushed the bar doors open and slowly made my way back to my stool. I motioned for the bartender and she returned to me. She told me she was surprised to see me back and I told her my car wasn't working. I told her a friend was coming to give me a lift and I was just coming back in to kill some time. I spaced out my words and tried my best not to slur. I asked her if she could load me up a beer and a shot. She chewed her lip for a moment and I could see her thinking. My intoxicated state apparent no matter how good an actor I thought I was. I reached into my pocket and slid her two twenties, tipping her a wink. The money shattered any moral disputes she had been fighting against, and she quickly cracked the top of a beer. She filled a shot glass and placed it in front of me, telling me to behave myself. I thanked her and assured her that I would. When she turned away, I slammed the shot, gasping at the sudden charge of heat. Whatever edge I had lost from vomiting returned as the rum hit my system. I snatched the beer up and sucked it down with the last drop sliding onto my tongue. I felt sick, like a soaked sponge left on the counter. I looked around, the room moving and swaying, and saw there were only two other people. They were over in the corner, not paying attention. And to my delight, I saw them wave over to the bartender. It looked like they knew her. She shot a quick look at me, and then went over to them. Heart racing, consciousness blinking, I quickly leaned and snatched the half full bottle of rum from the counter. I chanced to look over my shoulder and saw that my act had gone unnoticed. You can't get rid of me, I mumbled, tipping the bottle to my mouth. You can't make me stay here. I closed my eyes and drank. I didn't stop until everything went dark. I gasped and opened my eyes, soft clovers tickling my face. I breathed in and sighed, relief running through me. I got to my knees 
pulling myself up and surveyed the meadow. Something was wrong. The sun was hidden behind thick gray clouds, a blanket of dark cotton. I craned my neck and was met with nothing but silent gloom. The woods were quiet, the usual chorus of birds and bugs, absent. I could hear my heart hammering in my chest, a rush of beating blood in my ears. I looked to my left, scanning the tree line, and suddenly felt sick as my eyes focused on the scene before me, a deep fear sparking in my chest. The forest was ripped in half, leaving a dark corridor of splintered ruin. It looked like a train had exploded through the woods, obliterating everything in its path. Fractured trees and uprooted underbrush spilled out into the clearing, the remains of nature. What is going on? I whispered, voice tainted with fear. I suddenly spotted something in the pond, floating on the surface, and as I squinted to try and make out what it was, my eyes went wide and panic foamed in my throat. No, I cried, charging towards the water's edge. I splashed into the shadows at full speed, tripping and then pulling myself up. I shoved lily pads aside and sloshed deeper, the horror before me, gaining clarity. Russ, I said, reaching out for his motionless body. The water was up to my waist as I grabbed at him, pulling him up from under. He was dead weight in my arms, his head rolling against my chest as I dragged him toward shore. Come on, come on, Russ, I begged, gritting my teeth, heart racing, muscles groaning. His eyes were closed, and he didn't move. I finally got us onto the grass where we collapsed in a rush of weight and water. I struggled to regain my breath as I got to my knees and flipped Russ over on his back. My heart sank. His face was a mess of cuts and dark bruises. His clothes were a tangled jumble of torn fabric, brushing strands of wet hair from his face. Who did this to you, Russ? I felt like I already knew the answer. I shifted myself over him, fighting panic. I placed my hands over his chest and began CPR. Please, wake up, I begged, pumping his chest. Please, you have to wake up. Don't do this, Russ, please. I leaned down and blew into his mouth, tears starting to leak from my eyes. I felt helpless, alone, and filled with overwhelming despair. Why did everything always have to go to shit? Why did I always end up making things worse? Why couldn't I escape the never-ending stream of misfortune? Please, I said, now beating on Russ's chest. Please, don't do this. Suddenly, in a rush of urgency, the eyes of Russ snapped open, and he vomited up a great gout upon water. He coughed and sputtered, emptying his stomach as his body convulsed. I leaned back on my knees, unable to believe it. Relief swept over me, a cackle escaping my lips. You're... you're alive, I cried, gripping the shoulder of Russ as he wiped his mouth and lay on his back. Russ kept his eyes shut, his voice terribly weak. Hey... Hey, Slip. You just can't seem to stay away, can you? What happened to you? Why is everything different? Russ touched his face before answering. He found me. He found me with you already gone. And he didn't like that. Who? Who did? I knew the answer. I jerked my head to the woods, the sound of the drum robbing my attention. No, not now. Please. Russ broken and defeated, said, he's coming back to finish the job. And if you're here, he's going to get you. The drum was getting loud. I leaned down and grabbed the arm of Russ. What does he want? Why is he doing this? Russ closed one eye and looked painfully at me with the other one. He's not doing this, Jack. You are. My body went cold and I said nothing with my throat going dry. Suddenly, a long rising whistle rose from the forest, first high, then dipping low. The notes bounced off the dark clouds and echoed across the meadow, filling me with dread. Russ tried to sit up, grasping at my arm. You can't keep doing this, he said, 
desperation filling his voice. You can't keep coming here like this. He's gonna kill you. My lips tremble and I look down at Russ. Um, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I put my hands over my face, sobbing. Jesus, what have I done? Jackie. The voice cracked through the air like a clap of thunder and my heart tripped into my rib cage, crippling fear spreading across my chest. Another shrieking whistle, a sharp drill in my ears, boring into my skull. The ground shook beneath my feet, and I suddenly heard the exploding wood and crashing underbrush from the forest. The sound was distant, but approaching the meadow at a tremendous speed. The whistling man, I whispered. I stood up and faced the tree line, Sweat cold in my spine with cold fear, and I licked my mouth with my face pale. Don't let him get you, slip, Russ said from the ground. Tears ran down my cheeks. I closed my eyes as the drum and constant whistle blasted around me. I could hear trees crashing to the earth as the whistling man rocketed towards me from the woods. I felt helpless and terrified. A lone man against a tsunami of power and devastation. The whistling man exploded from the tree line and into the meadow. Immediately, everything went silent. My heart counted the seconds against my chest. I squeezed my eyelids shut even tighter. I suddenly felt the presence of someone standing directly in front of me. Hot breath on my face. I've been looking for you, Jackie. Something said, inches from my face. I kept my eyes firmly shut. My knees were shaking, and I felt my bladder release in a rush of terror. My lips quivered, and tears dripped down my chin. Go away, I croaked, my voice a dry rasp. I felt a heavy hand rest on my shoulder, followed by a low chuckle. Ah, Jack, why would you want that? You brought me here. I shook my head squeezing my eyes shut even tighter. No, not anymore. A hand gripped my chin. Look at me. Open your eyes. Look at what you created. Please, I sobbed, spittle spraying. Just leave me alone. Open your eyes, Jackie. Weeping, I slowly pried my bloodshot eyes open and the breath rushed from my lungs in a haunting wave of horror. I was staring into my own face. The whistling man grinned as the recognition twisted my face with shock. You see, there ain't nothing to be afraid of. This is just who you are. I took a step back, shaking, trembling. No, no, this isn't who I am. He chuckled and took a step closer. Yes, it is, Jack. I violently shook my head. No, no, I'm a good person. I'm nothing like you. The whistling man suddenly stepped ahead and grabbed me by the throat with his grip impossibly strong. Time we finally settled this, Jackie. Just leave me alone, I said as his grip tightened around my throat. He leaned into me, grinning, and squeezed darkness into my vision. It's over, Jack. Stars swam around me as the world began to fade. With one last gasp, I whisper, Please, just... Let me go home. Right as I was about to pass out, a blackness ate my eyes. The grip around my throat was removed. I gasped and fell to my knees, the metal rushing back into focus, color and clarity, realigned as I coughed and sputtered, clutching my aching throat. I looked up in a relieved confusion, and my eyes went wide. Russ was holding the whistling man from behind, one arm wrapped around his throat in a chokehold, He had his other arm over the whistling man's face with his hand shoved inside his mouth, gripping his upper jaw with commanding strength. Sweat stood out on the face of Russ, his eyes two coals of burning fire. His voice crackled like a blazing furnace. He doesn't need you anymore. Leave him alone, goddammit. The whistling man growled around Russ's hand, fury shaking him. I am him. The neck muscles of Russ strained as he began to pull the whistling man's head backwards, howling with authority. Nah, any, more, screaming with exhausted effort, Russ ripped the whistling man's head back, 
between his shoulder blades in an explosion of blood and bone. I heard a sickening pop as his spine shattered, blood gushing from the now lifeless mouth. Gasping, Russ pulled his bloody hand from the whistling man's jaws and shoved the dead man to the ground. He looked at me, chest heaving. You okay, Slick? Shock rooted me to the ground, complete disbelief freezing me where I sat. Crying, I got into my feet and embraced him, weeping onto his chest. Russ stroked my hair and let me cry into him, his heart beating against my chest. Thank you so much. I wept. I'm so sorry. I'm so fucking sorry for doing this. Russ pulled me away and took me by the shoulders. You're a lot stronger than you think, Jack. Never forget that. I wiped tears from my face, unable to stop more from coming. I won't forget. I promise I won't. Thank you so much. Russ nodded. Now, are you ready to go back? I nodded, sniffling. Russ closed his eyes. Good luck to you, Slick. I'm proud of you. And with that, he pushed me backwards. And I awoke with a start on the bar floor. Faces were looking down at me, a blur of color and noise. I blinked and then everything rushed into focus. It was the bartender and the two men she had been talking to. Their faces were filled with concern and I realized they were talking to me. Hey, you okay? One of the men asked, getting down on one knee and helping me sit up. Relief washed over me in a suffocating wave as I gripped my teeth as my eyes filled with tears. I smiled up at the three of them, my head clear and focused, all traces of a hangover gone. Um, alright, thank you. I must have slipped in my stool and bumped my head is all. The bartender told me they had heard a crash and looked over to see me lying on the floor, unmoving. She said it had taken them a little bit to wake me, almost to the point of calling an ambulance. I assured them I was okay climbing to my feet and brushing myself off. My calm demeanor clearly confused them to the point of not pressing me further. I thanked them for their concern and told them I was going to call a cab and go home. After making sure I was really okay, they told me to take care of myself. That's when I smiled and said, I will. That was three years ago. It's been a long, hard road since that night, but I'm doing well. It took months for my wife to get over that horrific act of selfishness, but I have proven to her since then that I will never be that man again. I can't believe she didn't leave me, and it fills me with eternal gratitude. I spent this time proving to my family that they can rely on me. I have shown them my resolve and we've grown closer, making it through these horrible early months, but we're stronger now, and life has begun to show promise of happiness. I did end up losing my job, but my boss was able to secure me another with a sister company. It was an act of kindness that I wasn't expecting, and it furthered me down the path to positivity. It's taken three long years to rebuild my life, and it's been three years since I had a drink. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it was easy, because it wasn't. It was hard, impossibly hard, even after everything I went through. There were days I almost gave in to temptation, but I would open up to my wife during those times of weakness, and she helped me through them. She gave me hope that I could change. But I had to face what I had become first. And I will never go back to being that man. I'll find my own way to the meadow. I know it's out there, waiting for me. The path to its peaceful serenity. Growing more clear the longer I walk the road of recovery. And even though I come so far and made so much progress, I'm still filled with fear. Because I know he's out there waiting for me. He'll always be there. The whistling man.